trade talks turmoil, TTIP, hope or fear? That's our topic today on Quadriga. Welcome. Negotiators from the U.S. and Europe are working around the clock trying to finalize a new transatlantic trade agreement. They thought they were working in secret until a large chunk of the negotiating text found its way onto the Internet. Could that spell the end of TTIP? The planned agreement is bringing more and more people out onto the streets in protest. Europeans are worried about consumer protection and environmental standards, especially after Greenpeace leaked damaging information from the ongoing talks. Investors and companies are eager for a deal. The German Chancellor and the U.S. President both stand behind TTIP, saying it will encourage economic growth and trade. So will TTIP really raise all boats or will it benefit only wealthy corporations and the elite? That's what we want to talk about with three experts who are following TTIP's progress carefully. Stormy Mildner is the head of the Department of External Economic Policy at the Federation of German Industries, BDI. She says German industry believes that TTIP will give our companies and our small and medium scale enterprises in particular better access to the U.S. market. However, it's important that TTIP remain ambitious and comprehensive. We do not want TTIP light. Mata Leming is editor of the opinion page of Der Tagesspiegel. He says TTIP will most probably boost economies on both sides of the Atlantic and strengthen transatlantic ties. European fears about decisively lower food and environmental standards are overblown. And Stefan Krug is the head of Greenpeace's political unit, the NGO behind last week's major leak. He says TTIP has to be stopped because in the agreement, consumer and environmental protection are less important than business interests. Mr. Krug, aren't business interests pretty important for Europe at the moment? Growth here is lagging. Unemployment is drastically high in many, many countries. Can Europe really afford to walk away from an, from an agreement that would create the biggest free trade zone in the world? Well, that's upon Europe to decide. Uh, what we did is just leaking the state of play of negotiations that has been dealt so far completely behind closed doors, even for elected um, members of parliament. They couldn't just talk publicly about it. So we just, uh, we just opened the floor for a public debate. And uh, if Europe decides to whether to, to, to continue these talks or to, to skip them, I, I wouldn't say that this is the moment, uh, at, the, at this moment, uh, the moment hasn't come. But I think that's up to Europe. We just did a job of, of making clear what's, what's at stake. But clearly, Greenpeace is of the opinion that what is at stake certainly does not justify an agreement of the kind that's shaping up. Well, yes, we are very crit critical towards TTIP. We think that this is a kind of uh, uh, trade deal which we don't need. I mean, there has been already a lot of uh, ongoing relationships between the US and Europe in terms of economic uh, trade. Um, we don't think that, as it is set up, it can really boost um, standards. Uh, to the contrary, it will probably lower the standards we already have in Europe, and maybe also some of the, the standards that are higher in the US. So uh, at the end, uh, we don't expect very good things to come out of this. We're going to take another look at the standards, but isn't slightly lower standards p perhaps a, a justifiable price to pay for getting more jobs? I don't think so, no. We, we shouldn't lower uh, consumer protection. We shouldn't lower environmental protection standards. This is something we have uh, worked for and uh, very hardly worked uh, over the last decades to get this standard, which is a very high standard worldwide in Europe. Uh, and I don't think we should put it at risk just be because some corporates need a bit more profit. Ms. Milder, according to classical free trade theory, it only brings prosperity for all if the gains uh, from opening markets are used to compensate those who lose out, perhaps lose their jobs, perhaps see their wages fall uh, in the face of stronger competition. That almost never happens, which is why trade has become a major issue on both sides of the Atlantic. What is the experience that we have seen with an agreement like NAFTA? Doesn't it indicate that, in fact, those gains rarely get redistributed? No, we actually don't agree with that observation. Um, if you look at the uh, history of Germany or the European Union, we see very clearly that um, trade has boosted economic growth, it has boosted income, and it is a very, very important foundation of our wealth. And I would say so also for um, the North American area, for Canada, for the United States, and also for Mexico. Um, looking at Germany, every 
fourth job in this country depends on trade. In industry, it's every second job. Um, trade to GDP is 84 or almost 86 percent. That is massively important for our wealth. We depend on global markets and open global markets. So we believe that um, TTIP is definitely something we should not walk away from, especially looking at some of our um, European neighbor countries who have not experienced such sound growth rates as we did in the past years, but really need a new um, growth imp um, impulse. And we would say that this is a chance we should take. But TTIP is not just important because of economic growth and jobs. We believe that trade agreements are much more today than just about opening markets. It is about how we want to trade with each other. It's about global um, rules, really. So let's come back to that in just a moment. So we've got one con voice. We've got a pro <laughs> voice. Malta Lemmy, you can be the tiebreaker here. You said in your opening statement you thought TTIP would probably boost the U.S. and European economies. So a somewhat conditional statement there. The fact is the U.S. is already Germany's greatest trading partner, largest trading partner. Tariffs, duties already pretty low. So really, do you think the gains would justify the risks? Um, I'm not sure about the risks, but the gains is, I mean, if, if countries who have already agreements on trade uh, and business uh, don't need another agreement, then we don't need the European Union. We had agreements before between Germany and France, between Germany and Spain, between other countries, and we still think the European Union forming a huge uh, 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 unity of, of, uh, of common trade and common legal rules about the trade is a good idea. So I think that is, in principle, a good idea. The gains is, is dependent on uh, if we have TTIP light, a very small agreement, or the originally planned TTIP, which is now a big question. But let me make two, two more uh, points. One is European skepticism. The skepticism is not European. It's German, Germany, Austria and Luxembourg. All other 25 uh, member states of the European Union have a majority for TTIP. Next point is secrecy. Um, does Greenpeace have, if, if you're discussing about what to do next with a spectacular action doing that in public, no. Are agreements on the climate summit in Paris done and open and the Russians and Chinese saying what kind of uh, points they want to make? No, it's not even made a protocol after that, which is done with TTIP. Does say two coalition parties have open uh, uh, discussions about how they form a coalition and make an agreement? No. All this is made behind closed doors and to make this, the secrecy, the top critical point about TTIP, I think it's overblown. Um, I think I heard you saying <laughs> under your breath, <laughs> Sato Voce, that you don't entirely agree in terms of the geographical distribution of opposition. Yes, I mean, first of all, let me just add one point. Uh, growth uh, so far is a promise of TTIP that hasn't been um, really um, uh, delivered. Uh, the European Commission itself now says that the growth rate will be 0.5% over the over time period of 10 years. So it's practically nothing. So that's, that's on growth. Uh, on the terms of transparency, nobody is expecting uh, the uh, politicians uh, sitting at the marketplace in Brussels and discussing it publicly. I followed the climate negotiations very closely and I can tell you uh, they are much more transparent than TTIP has ever been. Um, Even now, because the European Commission has made some changes over time. They have now set up reading rooms. They say this is the most transparency they have ever provided on ongoing diplomatic negotiations. Well, sorry, but a reading room where a, a, a member of parliament can enter only uh, under under guidance, uh, is not allowed to take uh, copies, has not the, uh, the allowance to take an expert with him to understand these very complicated texts and should not talk about anybody afterwards, has to sign a paper on this. This is probably not the highest stage of but, transparency. But let me you ask you again, so that means you have official Russian and Chinese documents saying with, with what kind of points they are going into climate negotiations? Of course. Of course you know the that positions beforehand. You can if you even, know them, that's you, another point. You, you have official Chinese you, documents. Of course. Okay. You can even participate in, in negotiations as an observer. You're not allowed to contribute to the discussion, but you can follow the negotiations point by point. So that's a completely different scene of transparency. And I don't understand really why a trade uh, deal needs this type of complete secretness. I mean, I perfectly understand that there has been confidence somehow between the, between the, the parties uh, uh, negotiating, but at 
it's, it's no sign of transparency if the public is completely out of the play. Let's come back in just a moment to the geographic issue and get Stormy Milner to answer to that, because, again, she's shaking her head now. Uh, clearly, you don't quite agree either on the point about growth or the point about transparency. Well, actually, both. <laughs> um, with regard to the approval ratings, there's a Eurobarometer poll. Um, they do it twice a year, and the last one in November showed pretty clearly that in for Europe as a whole, um, the support rate is still pretty high. Um, the majority of Europeans support TTIP. And it's, um, it's actually four countries where the majority is against TTIP. Um, it's uh, those and now also Slovenia, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but it's pretty, I mean, the debate we are having here in Germany, it's pretty specific. Um, I want to come I, back to that later, as I said, because that. we do have and, a little report yeah. about that. But give and, us your view on the growth point that was just made and also on the point about yeah. transparency. We believe that although we already trade a lot with the United States, there are still um, um, a lot of gain um, we could uh, could utilize by getting rid of still existing trade barriers. You, you said that tariffs are already pretty low, but taking into account how much we trade with each other, even those low trade barriers will lead to quite a bit of an impact. And on the other hand, there are tons of technical barriers to trade, and I'm not talking about those which are consumer standards or environmental standards, but technical barriers to trade, like a machine is to be normed, um, a standard where we could cooperate more, and that also promises, um, promises really quite a bit. On the issue of transparency, um, I think it is, I mean, transparency is really vital for the legitimacy of the negotiations, and we always have supported that the negotiation mandate should be public, um, the proposals should be public, but we also believe there needs to be a room for negotiators to get together and negotiate. I mean, um, I'm pretty sure that you also wouldn't like us to be in the room with the negotiators and wheezing in their necks um, as we wouldn't like you to be there. So I think there needs to be a room of protection for them. What do you say to the charges that, OK, there are Maybe some opposition in other European countries, but it's absolutely strongest here in Germany. It's brought tens of thousands of people out onto the streets. Why is that? Well, there's a strong uh, consumer and environmental movement in Germany. Uh, Germany environmental policy has a very high uh, respect in, in, in the public uh, debate. Uh, but I think it's a growing, uh, it's a growing uh, skepticism all over Europe now. You see the reactions in France, for example. Uh, I mean, uh, Chancellor Merkel didn't say the same thing then that said uh, President Hollande. So I think uh, there is a much, much stronger opposition now growing. And I think, well, of course, specifically in Germany, you're very sensitive uh, if environmental standards are put at, at risk and also consumer protection. This, these are very important issues. And as far as TTIP stands, it now shows that uh, in, in the regulatory uh, cooperation which is planned, these standards are put at stake. Let's take a look at some of the things that are worrying German consumers. Many Germans have fears about TTIP. They're scared in the future they'll have to eat chlorinated chickens or GM corn, two symbols for what many view as lower consumer safety standards in the U.S. Others are worried about social dumping, that good jobs in Germany with social benefits will be replaced by more precarious ones with longer hours and lower wages. Some are afraid of environmental impacts, that fracking, a highly controversial method for obtaining oil and natural gas, will be extended. Or that high standards in the area of renewable energy could be viewed by the U.S. as a trade barrier. Then there are fears involving culture. The U.S. is against book price fixing and film subsidies. Its negotiators say subventions in cultural fields distort competition. So are the fears justified? Will TTIP bring Europe more problems than solutions? So, Monte Leming, is this just another case of German angst, or is there more to it than that? There is more to it, but there is angst into that as well. I would say there, it, it, the perception of TTIP in, in, in Germany, it, it, it combines with the perception of America in general. Uh, we have the greedy companies, greedy lawyers uh, who just wait for, for class action to be taken. We have uh, low environmental and food standards. And I think history and, and reality speaks the opposite is true. If we look for, for example, the Volkswagen scandal or the FIFA scandal or all what, which, is, which is brought up, it's in the United States. And we have the, the mad and cow disease in Europe. It's the United States and that actually could bring these scandals bring to light. Bring these scandals up and have, lower, have, have higher standards in, in, in car manufacturers and in many... 
things like this. Interesting that you make that point. And because if, you go, if you go to a fruit and vegetable shop, they all wear plastic gloves. Try to find that in Germany. It seems that many Americans actually believe their own standards are higher than yeah. the European ones. You lived in the US. You were bureau chief there for your paper for, I think, five years. Yes. What's your impression of the standards there? The standards are quite high. The standards are quite high, and, and the punishment for companies who violate these standards is even higher. I mean, if you have BP, Exxon, petrol scandal, uh, 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 and there's a, they pay billions in damage uh, payment for that. The Volkswagen scandal, they will pay billions for that because the punishment is really high if you violate these standards. So this is one point. The other point is, why is it that in Germany... It's, it's right, Germans are have very high expectations toward food and, 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 and ecological standards. But I think something else happened in the past, and it was the NSA, the National Security Agency scandal, and they felt violated by the Americans, and they feel they need some kind of revenge because they think it's more in the interest of the Americans than the Europeans to have this kind of deal. So this is this kind of perception, and it plays into that perception of TTIP that is saying no if we say no we give the Ameri we tell the Americans a lesson or something like this so I think it's no purpose why the extreme left and right wings are closing ranks on this on the street so the standards issue um, Stefan Krug uh, let's start with chicken the US chicken coated with chlorine Ch European chicken often injected with antibiotics is that so much better why shouldn't consumers be permitted to choose whether they like their chicken poisoned by chlorine or poisoned by antibiotics? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a choice between poisons, you're right. But, uh, well, it's not about being against America or get, being against any, anything that is coming from there. I mean, I, I may remind you that Greenpeace was founded by Americans and Canadians, so it's not in our DNA to be, to be against America. And even some, higher, some standards are higher in the US. Uh, let's take the nitrogen uh, oxide uh, emissions, for example. We would be happy to have them in Germany. But the problem is what corporates are doing, be it in America or be it in Europe, uh, it's all about the same, the same problem. And the problem is simply that if uh, an industrialized agriculture, a completely industrialized agriculture with GMO food, with uh, hormone-treated uh, meat, uh, maybe some chicken and chlorine, uh, maybe this, this is not the biggest problem, but if this type and this system of agriculture is taking over, then we have a huge problem here because we have a very different agriculture. We have a very small-scale culture, agriculture at the same time. We have big corporates, but also small regional producers. And the standards that are in Europe now valuable, especially the ecological standards, they are quite higher and much tougher than they are in the US. So we, we should keep them. Higher standards, of course, mean higher costs. The system you are advocating is in many ways a paternalistic system. Not all consumers necessarily can and want to pay more for their food. Isn't it somewhat um, presumptuous to say that those of lower income shouldn't have the right to choose cheaper food that is perhaps not quite at that same level of standard? Well, we don't say that. Uh, people can do that today. We don't need more imports from the US to, to fulfill that. We don't say that everybody now has to buy eco food and no, no other food would be allowed. But what we say is that the industrial agriculture has a lot of flaws. It has a disastrous impact on the environment. It is the number one problem in terms of biodiversity, in terms of soil pollution, in terms of water pollution. We all know that. So we should try to strive to get a better agriculture. And this is not especially the agricultural model that is uh, used in the US, which is a large-scale industrial model. We should, we should strive to, to other models, and I don't think that TTIP will bring any improvement here. Stami Milner, there are suggestions at times that TTIP would replace European social market capitalism with something more like the US casino capitalist model, putting corporations in the driver's seat, as Greenpeace said when it leaked these documents. Are you concerned about that? Is there an element of truth to that? Um, we, we don't think so. Um, first of all, I wanted to um, say something on the agricultural market in the United States. I don't think it is quite correct to say that it's only industrial agriculture, which the U.S. has. It has a huge market for small um, and medium-sized farms and also organic farming. The organic farming market in the U.S. is bigger than our market. And the criteria for organic farming is, are just as high as here. They are even stricter with regard to the use of antibiotics in the meat production. So I think this painting black and white, um, that is something we really 
really shouldn't do. Um, the US has higher standards in some areas, we have higher standards in others. And the question is now is, will TTIP bleed to a lower standard, to the lower common denominator? And we don't believe so, because um, most of our consumer protection standards, environmental standards, are European laws. And our lawmakers, the European Parliament, why should they ever, ever agree to a TTIP which is going to take away what they have fought for in higher standards? On the other side of the Atlantic, the US Congress has fought, and also President Obama has fought for higher standards through the um, Environmental Protection Agency, for example. Why ever should he agree on, a, on, on the lowest denominator and, and lower standards? I just don't see that. Um, not in a democratic system. So let me, let me just uh, take us into the future, the very short-term future. The TTIP negotiations are now moving into what the negotiators call the end game. The rush is on to get the agreement settled by this summer. The big question is, can the negotiators overcome one particularly thorny issue related to commercial arbitration commissions? Let's take a look. For four years, the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes has been arbitrating an explosive case. Swedish energy giant Vattenfall is suing Germany. The company says it will lose money because the country decided in 2011 to phase out nuclear energy, forcing Vattenfall to take some nuclear reactors offline early. The firm says it's been treated unjustly and that earlier investments are now worthless. It's demanding 4.7 billion euros in reparations. The case has heightened fears that if TTIP comes into force, foreign companies that operate in Germany could have national laws overruled by the court at the World Bank in Washington. Do such courts pose a threat to national sovereignty? What do you think, Malte Leming? Threat to national sovereignty? And if so, can a compromise be found? I don't think in general that courts pose, pose a threat in democracies because calls, uh, uh, courts are driven the, by the rule... These are commercial I, arbitration I know, I know, courts, I know but course. they are driven by the rule of law. They have laws they, that they follow up and they need to, to see if they were obliged to. In the last 30 years, um, I think there were 17 cases that the Americans brought to court like that. So I don't think that... It, and, and, and you, can, you can give these courts regulations that minimizes the risk that, is, that we've just seen. Stefan Krug, the EU Commission has made a counterproposal for an EU trade court or for EU-US trade court, essentially, that would be a state entity. Could Greenpeace live with that? Is that a compromise that you'd like to see happen? Well, we don't see it as a compromise. We only see it as a kind of cosmetic uh, attempt to get TTIP uh, dealt out. Because the simple fact is that it also would create a justice, a system of court and justice in parallel to the already existing democratically legitimized system. We don't need that between two very developed states or groups of states. If you do an investment uh, in a country that has a very bad governance, I don't know, a very uh, developing country still, with corruption, with many problems on the place, I understand that investors want to have an assurance, want to have some kind of... Uh, rule pos possibilities to, to, to make lawsuits against the government. But this is not necessary between the US and uh, Europe. Um, it, we have a perfectly developed system of justice. We don't need private arbitraries to, to, to do the job. And then uh, having no, um, no possibility for um, ordinary people and ordinary courts to, to, to claim that, that decision. Stormy Milner, there have been U.S. suggestions to just sideline the issue and go with a leaner version of TTIP, consensus where it can be found. You say you don't want TTIP light. Why not? <laughs> um, because um, today trade is not just about um, shipping goods from one, one country to another. Trade has become very different from 20, 30, 40 years ago. It is about trade and services. It is about digital to trade. It has something to do with um, data. It is, um, trade has become a very different animal, so to say. And for this, we also need new, new rules, uh, rules which we don't have yet. Um, it would be great to have these through the WTO, the World Trade Organization, but since the Doha round, um, since 2001, has not delivered these rules, we need to see how we can set those rules um, with partners who are very close to us with regard to um, the norms and values we have. So we view and TTIP as a, a chance to um, shape these rules. And by the way, investment protection is one of these areas where this could really be a good case.
So very briefly, if you would, the window of opportunity is closing both for this show and for TTIP. The negotiators want to get it done by summer because after Obama's term ends, there may not be any pro-trade person in the White House. Montelemy, will it happen? 60% uh, yes. I would say don't underestimate the resistance in Europe, but don't under underestimate the ambitions of Obama in his last months. Stefan Krug, do you see it going through? I don't think so, to be honest, and I hope that also the Canadian-European trade agreement does not see the light of day because it's a TTIP in, in, a, in TTIP light, so to say. Stormy Milner? It will be tricky, but for us, um, the content is more important than time. We want a TTIP right, not a TTIP light. Thanks very much to all of you for being with us today, and thanks to all of you out there for tuning in. See you soon.